is our Time Space Visualizer event, and this week's subject is the missing episodes. 253 episodes of Doctor Who were recorded between 1963 and 1969. And up until a few years back, 106 of those episodes were still missing from the BBC archives. In a miraculous find, my next guest um, brought home nine unique and brand new old Doctor Who episodes for us in the form of the Web of Fear and the Enemy of the World. And it's my pleasure to introduce the Indiana Jones of Doctor Who Missing Episodes himself, Phil Morris. How are you, Phil? Hi, Jason. How are you? I'm very Hope well. How are you, sir? Strange times. They are indeed strange times. Hopefully for the next half an hour, we can take everybody's mind off it for a little bit. Absolutely. That's what we're here for. Absolutely. So we're here. We're celebrating. Um, well, we're celebrating Enemy of the World a little bit later on with your um, tweet a -thon. Um, but I want to delve into the, to the, uh, the history a little bit of missing episodes. And my first question for you, Phil, is um, what piqued your interest? What, what got you interested in looking for lost or missing uh, TV episodes of, of anything, really? Really, Doctor Who or whatever it was you were finding? Well, strangely enough, the thing that, uh, that attracted me first was actually comedy. It was um, not only but also, which was uh, it's a lovely comedy with Peter Cook and Dudley Moore from the the 1960s, that magic layer we all love. And I just found out there were episodes missing and I have one of those kind of inquisitive minds and I thought, well, I'd like to know more. So kind of looked into that and found, you know, it wasn't just obviously not only but also, but it covered programs like Doctor Who, Dixon of Doc Green, uh, Z Cars, you know, there were many programs that were, you know, periodically wiped by the BBC uh, for reuse of their videotapes back in the day. And um, what, what, what made you do something more than anybody else had done? So obviously, what, you, you know, lots of people had gone out there, looked for missing episodes in the past of, 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 of all sorts of TV, but in particular Doctor Who. What made you do the next best thing, i.e. The, the not just phoning up the, studio, the, the, the sort of foreign TV companies? What made you actually get up and, and go and start hunting, if you like? Well, that's a really interesting point. It's, uh, I call this my Paul McCartney moment, and that's basically what I had. You know, you, you know you're always kicking an idea around in your head and you're thinking to yourself, you know, you know I wonder if there are still programs out there, you know, you know, the National Heritage, really, you know, and they should be at the BBC for, you know, for obviously us and future generations to enjoy. And, you know, you just, when you just go into sleep at night, just before you're about to drop off, this little voice in your head goes, well, why don't you do it? And you kind of think, who was that? And it's, it was one of those moments. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, can I, could I, you know, is it worth a try? You know, you, you, you throw all those kind of questions about whatever you're going to do. And I thought, you know what, let's go and do this. And, um, and I did, you know, the rest is kind of history. And what, um, so you obviously, you, 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 um, you visited many, many countries in, in oh, the search um, and then for, for lost and then episodes. Yeah. Um, how many countries would you say you've searched over the years? Oh, probably more than, probably 50, 50 countries, something like that in total. It's, people always think, obviously people that, you know, are probably really interested in Doctor Who. They say, okay, it was sold to this station in this country. So all you have to do is go to that country and, you know, and ask the people, have you got this program? but it's a really complicated situation when you are searching overseas for the simple reason that the staff that were there all those years ago have long gone, probably been replaced two or three times. Some of the stations have actually relocated um, and the storerooms that they have are completely uncatalogued. And so they should be. Why would they be interested in old foreign broadcast material when they have their own material and a business to run from day to day? And it's only when a certain... Phil Morris turns up that, you know, he says, well, I can catalogue that for you, you know, and, and that was kind of the way we operated in the early days and supplying those stations with some, you know, some of the old anachronistic equipment that we used to send out. And it, it kind of blossomed from there, really. And it's, you know, it's, it's been a labour of love ever since. So it, it wasn't a Doctor Who find initially, um, but Sky at Night and some of the Morecambe and Wises, if I'm correct? 
the initial find, that I, my, the very first find that I had was a, a 1963 Sky at Night, which was a really special program for, uh, for the late Sir Patrick Moore, which was, um, it was basically, uh, it was him with Arthur C. Clarke, who was a really close friend of, um, of his. And when he got that episode back, I cannot tell you how absolutely delighted he was. It was like, you know, you, could, you, you wouldn't be able to, to think or believe that somebody like Patrick Moore, and he was probably in his late 80s then, that, you know, he, was, he could be surprised, and he absolutely was. He felt, you know, he said it, his actual words were, if there's one episode of the program that could have been saved, that's it. And that, to me, was wow. You know, especially because it was his friend, it was his school friend, Arthur C. Clarke, and to do that for somebody, you can't monetize those kind of things. Um, and neither should you. Uh, and I can just tell you a quick story on that. He did an absolutely wonderful thing for me. My um, cousin, uh, Hillary, she had breast cancer. And sadly, you know, she was terminal. And he, 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 I think Patrick at the time, he couldn't sign his signature any, any longer because obviously I think arthritis or, or something like that. So he used to stamp his books. So he sent her one of these stamp books and she was absolutely delighted, but he went further. And being such a kind man that he is, what he, what he actually did, he recorded a very, very special edition of the sky at night just for her. And I can tell you, I remember taking the call and those screams resonate in my ears to this day. It was absolutely a magical experience. And, you know, it's when somebody's suffering with, you know, you know as many, many people do, of course, um, with, with terminal illness. And you can just make that one day a lot brighter, really, for a lot of people. Then it's just magic, really, isn't it? it that's that, you know, it's just magical. There's um, there is a sense of magic about it, and something that you were able to do just brought a smile or whatever that was. But the screams, by the oh, sounds of, of it, said it all for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, can I just say it's the same with Doctor Who? I mean, I can. I I, I did actually. There was a homeless guy I met when I was in London when I was travelling down to the XL, and he had actually, you know, through whatever where he was living, he had actually bought. Uh, the web of fear because he, he said to me i grew up with this program and when you meet people like that it, it's really really humbling you know because he was telling me you know he'd been in the army and he, you know he'd suffered from mental illness and stuff like that which i completely understand because obviously in my background I, i'd been i used to work in the offshore oil industry and uh, i was kidnapped in 2006 and for a period i suffered from some post-traumatic stress disorder and so I had a good feel of that. So I knew exactly where he was coming from. But it's, it's a very, very humbling experience. Something I'm, I, you know, I love to share because, uh, I mean, it's all about people, really, isn't it? That's what, uh, that's what life's about, really. You know, everything else, it's not important. You know, it comes and goes. But people are important. They are indeed. And there's no doubt at all that um, what you brought home in, in the form of Web of Fear and the Enemy of the World has brought um, a great deal of enjoyment to a great deal of, of Doctor Who fans um, oh, right yeah. across right across the world. There's there's no yeah. doubt about that. Where did the lead come from? For so presumably you picked up a hint that there might be some episodes here. There might be some episodes there. What led you to those to those film recordings? You know that sounds really scientific, and you know, and you know, I've, I had put a lot of thought into it, and. The first thought I actually had was, you know, I could be looking for the needle in a haystack here. So a country like Nigeria, you know, it's, it's a huge, huge country. How do I cover that? How do I find certain things that are there? And the way I normally think, and a little voice in my head again, turned around and said, well, don't look for a needle. Why don't you go and take the haystack? Which is, which is, which is my thinking all along. Anyway, you know, it's kind of thing. I'll get everything, and then, which is what we actually did in the end. You know, it's uh, we make no bones about that. You know, we we had a, an arrangement with the uh, the Nigerian Television Authority, and all those old programs that they had, we were we were allowed to uh, to take, and we did. <laughs> so it was, um, 
we just basically, Jason, what we did, we went from, you know, we, we were working with some absolutely wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, my team, the people that I work with, and also the people at the NTA were just, they were so helpful and, you know, wonderful, wonderful people. And, and, and to be honest, uh, we're still, I still have great friends there to this day, absolutely great friends and colleagues there. And they were just so helpful. Where did the search start? So you, you were in Nigeria. Did you, was there any particular station you were stations you were singling out at that time? Not really, because there's a, a, a quite a simple reason that for that in Nigeria, and that is they had an internal bicycle system. So basically, because they were trying to keep all of their stations kind of with programming to show all the time, programs would move from station to station as things were available. Just so basically, everybody had had kind of something to watch. Um, so basically anything could be anywhere. You could be looking at a, you know, a sales document from the BBC. It didn't mean anything. It didn't mean anything at, at that point for the simple reason that, uh, everything moved around so much. But at the point we came into that, that television, televisual system, that system had broken down. They were no longer showing, you know, film. They were no longer showing videotape. Everything, you know, was moving more towards the digital formats and platforms at that point. And it was kind of we found as we visited every single station within within Nigeria, that's where we began to discover things. Uh, the I think the first city we we visited there was the capital. It was Abuja, because I remember quite distinctly we visited um, a sports stadium where it was their sports archive, which was just full of basically uh, some tapes and stuff like that. Very interesting experience. Uh, we had a, you know, a great tour there. Uh, also a very nice lunch, courtesy of the, uh, the head of the NTA at the time, who's still a good friend of mine. He does always provide uh, such a marvellous lunch. You know, a few, bottles of, uh, a few bottles of wine went down that day. It was marvellous. Um, but as I say, you know, it was, you know we visit. Um, I'm quite an inquisitive person. Um, and, you know, I always, you know, what's in that cupboard, you know, can we check in there? What's that building there? So everything was kind of checked quite, uh, quite methodically at the time. So, you know, there's no way we were going to leave anything behind. A absolutely not. No. And the road eventually led to Joss, as I'm, if I'm, if I recall correctly. To be honest with you, the, the road at first, uh, before we visited Joss was a, a station called Kaduna which was, uh, we did have, you know, uh, information that the programs were at that station, as long, you know, with also many, many other programs. Um, uh, that's the famous story people have probably heard, I'll probably tell you again, where I put, you know, I, I was in a prop store and um, there was a lot of gold props and carpets and things and I jumped up on a kind of a large shelf and pulled some carpets back and lo and behold, there was some episodes, another episode of The Sky at Night. Uh, and also some episodes of uh, Mogul, I think it was at the time. So, you know, it was handy to pull that carpet back, but th that just gives you an idea of my inquisitive kind of nature, you know, to look through stuff and see what's there while we're there, you know, see what we can bring back. I but remember, see I remember seeing the, um, I remember seeing the photo that you published um, of ah. all 12 of the film cans there. So exactly. you've obviously, yeah, you obviously, yeah. you found them at that point. What was the, what was your feeling when you found those cans? Well, basically, the route, basically Joss, is, Joss was at that time, it was a very small station. And we went into the film store there where there was a lot of Dexian, uh, Dexian sort of racking with uh, a lot of little pieces of masking tape saying things like the world about us or softly, softly or something like that. Or then it would be a cartoon, Hanna-Barbera or something else. Uh, and what you find most of the time, and a lot of, not a lot of people quite realize this, is sometimes the people that were working at the station would not put the correct films back into the correct cans. So you would always kind of tentatively remove the, you know, open the can up and, you know, check the leader, make sure the contents always kind of match what was, uh, what was written on the can. But uh, with, uh, with Doctor Who, there was, there was a piece of masking tape there, you know, about this long. And it said Doctor Who on it. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I pulled the first can down and I could tell you that it must have had about a, a two inches of, dust on it you know it was absolutely covered around the edge <coughs> i pulled that down and it said doctor who qq1 i thought oh thank god pull that down web of fear episode one open the can you know i could see i remember seeing rtv 
on the on the label you know they're giving it the duration you know 20 26 minutes or something like that 27 seconds and checking the leader on it and of course it was what it was supposed to be i thought oh lovely so then we had a count up of the cans there were 12 in total uh, and i thought right great okay we'll have these as well yeah m marked a few things up i think it was the more common wise there was a little damage we managed to get we brought it back but it was it was quite badly damaged that one which was disappointing because it was it was from that first series from Morecambe & Wise, which I'm really fond of because the writers were different. It wasn't actually the peak of Morecambe & Wise, but if you follow comedy at all, whether it's good or bad, it's part of the story. And to be, enable the BBC to have that so that they can tell the story and the development of Morecambe & Wise, not just show, oh, these are the best episodes, but the progression as you, you know, as an act does, it gets better and better and then reaches its peak which of course Morecambe and Wise did, and you know, it's still quite there really. Um, but with the Doctor Who stuff, um, you know, it was really, really interesting. There were 12 cans. What actually happened was I had to leave the station for some paperwork. Every station that we visited, we had to have a letter from obviously the capital and things in Nigeria and, and some of the other countries, they do not move as quickly as they do here. So. You could ask for something, it wouldn't come till the following day or stuff like that. So I had to head back to the hotel, um, you know, and type a letter out and get it sent back and print it off at the hotel for the next morning. Um, now, what happened was there were 12 cans. The head of the state, I think the, the news director at the station removed two of the cans or one of the cans. It might, it might have been one of the cans and one of the one, another can. Now, I don't know why he did this basically we asked him about it and he goes oh i'll put them back later on i thought well, why did you take them in the first place you know i didn't think anything of it at the time i thought okay because everything was being transported to the capital for us because we were going to take everything from you know one central place so the logistics of things were being organized by the nta uh, which you know basically at their stations you know you, you have to follow their uh, rules and regulations shall we say they're quite like the bbc in some ways that everything or quite like the BBC was probably in the 60s and the 70s. It's quite a rigid system to work in, but a bit more very, very nice people if you, you know, if you follow the, uh, the guidelines quite, uh, quite carefully. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, I was quite, when I, when I found out the episode hadn't been returned, I was quite bemused at this and, and really did chase it up. And I did get to speak to this, this guy at the station. And I said, well, we don't, we don't have those films. Where did you put those films? It's an important film. We, you know, we need it, you know, coming back. And he, this next line really stunned me. He said, I don't know anything about missing episodes. <laughs> and as soon as he said that, and I, you know, because you've got to understand, <clears throat> I mean, one of my guys said to me, Doctor Who, what's that? Is that, is that like a medical program? Uh, what, what's that? You know, they, they really don't know because obviously these things are not being broadcast since, you know, you know, since the crack of doom, really. So, uh, as I say, you know, it was, uh, as soon as he mentioned that to me, I thought, mm, you know, we've been infiltrated slightly here. You know, somebody's obviously got word of something and, you know, but we do have an idea where, uh, where that episode is. Um, we hope that the person who has it will return it for the fans so the web of fear can be completed and we can see the Brigadier's first appearance in the programme. We all want that to happen. I know you... Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. I know you've had to tread fairly carefully with this, I'm sure, in, in, sort, of, um, in sort of trying to locate it, but do you, do you genuinely believe that will come to light at some point, Phil? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. I, I, I sincerely believe that every missing episode eventually has to find its way back to the BBC. Of course it does. Of course it does, yeah. Absolutely. How, um, how damaging, ultimately, was the um, whole omni-rumour that grew up around the, the sort of search that you were undertaking? How damaging was that for you? It's only damaging, I think, when you engage with it. You know, it's, you know... I've always said that, you know, wishing things into existence, it doesn't do anything. Doing the hard work, going out there and doing the due diligence of how, how things actually work and follow every single little piece of information, always in the end will provide results, always. 
But, you know, any Doctor Who's always been like that. It's not a new thing to, you know, when I've come into it, you know, I, I used to read the rumours as much as everybody else, you know, and it's, I always say, you know, believe it when you see it. Someone can say, oh, Phil Morris has got this. Have you seen it? And Well, no, he, no, I haven't. Well, he, and he hasn't got it. You know, it's as simple as that, you know. <clears throat> if I've got something that's, that, that you know, the, the one thing I always think with this, with Doctor Who, and I'm, I'm, I'm really quite um, adamant about this, and that's, I like surprises. I was one of those people that bought the Tomb of the Cybermen when that came out. And I, I, it, in, the, in the world of Doctor Who, I think too much is known. The fans are great, but there, is, there, there are a degree of the fans that are, are absolutely, you know, they live and breathe it and can't walk away and have a, a cup of tea or whatever, which is, which is a bit sad. But, but, you know, I understand the passion. I really do. I get the passion. I'm a huge fan of, of you know, the early, early Doctor Who stuff, the classic series. I think it's wonderful. Um, you know, when you consider the budgets and, and stuff like that that they made, literally cracking television on. It's, it's totally amazing. And, and, of course cannot be replicated now it cannot be replicated you know it's uh, they are what they are do you think the rumors actually drove collectors to sort of push the episodes down and not let other things come to light well with regards to collectors i have i have a lot of friends who are collectors and i will i will quite i will tell you quite straight away now that at least six episodes missing episodes exist to my knowledge in the hands of private collectors I won't name them. I've said to them, you know, your best thing, you know, why don't you send, get it back to the BBC? And, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not very certain of, you know, how they'd be treated. Or, and the, the one thing they always say to me is, well, you've returned lots of episodes and look how you've been treated. And my answer to that is always, that's a minority of people. That's not the majority. I'll tell you now, I've met the majority of Doctor Who fans. They are the most articulate, wonderful, loving creative people you could ever meet meet and they they're in all walks of life they really are wonderful wonderful people you know I, you know I, and I'm, I'm i'm really you know i've been lucky enough to meet you know many of them in person you know very creative people <coughs> so so with, with private collectors you have to look into the history of um missing doctor who episodes it was very early on there were i won't name names but there were certain people in fandom who they would vilify people people like pamela nash who worked for bbc enterprises now pamela nash was vilified she destroyed all the doctor who episodes well she didn't she did her job which was you know once something the rights had expired on whatever program it was her job to protect the bbc's copyright which is quite correct it was up to somebody else at the bbc to say hang on a minute can we just have the negatives of anything you've struck for an overseas sale back to the archive. We don't want prints, just the negatives, which were eventually junked. That's all that needed to happen. That wasn't Pamela Nash's fault. That was a breakdown of communication within management of the BBC, because that's, if you actually just keep the negatives of any program, you don't need to keep the prints. And, you know, a new print can be struck from a negative. It's the best, you know, it's the best basis for creating, you know, a new print that you've got. So, uh, there were mistakes made, but, you know, we can all look back and, you know, I have a well-known saying, which, you know, people who work for me always say, and that's general hindsight, never won a war. We can only go forward. We cannot go back. We can learn from the past, and that's all we can do. A very true word, Phil. Um, Rumours persist, I think, that there are, there are still episodes potentially in Australia. Do you have any information that backs this up? I believe there are probably some episodes in Australia in private collector's hands. Um, and the best thing to do is not create a fuss around that. Let, let, it, let it work its way out is my, is my best advice. There are, there are some wonderful people who I've met who are looking for episodes who, who live and work in Australia. Um, and if anything comes to light, I think, you know, Everyone else will get to see it. You know, it's as simple as that. You know, I'm certainly not done on the on the Doctor Who front yet. I've, you know, I've I've been awfully busy. I know people think, well, it's been so many years, but I have to tell everyone at home here that that, that also, as well as having this thing behind me, I, I've got a life as well that uh, with what with a wife and young children that you know that they do take a lot of time. But I, I do devote a, a lot of my time. I am passionate about it. I want to see things back in the archive. I want them out there for the fans. But at the same time. 
I want them to be a surprise. <coughs> um, Phil, what would yeah. be your most desired story for, <coughs> for you to go out and find and bring back for the fans? I think the fans would like to see some things resolved. I think that they would first of all like to see the 10th Planet Part 4. Because in a historical sense, that completes, you know, William Hartnell's run. <clears throat> it also, the power of the Daleks, at least episode one, um, would be very, very nice, you know, to, uh, as I say, it's, again, it completes a run and it begins, it shows you Patrick coming in, being introduced as the second Doctor, which, you know, it's Patrick's centenary at the moment. And, <clears throat> you know, 100 years without Patrick making that program a success, and a lot of people forget about this. There will be no more Doctor Who. How revolutionary that was, what that actor did, and that production team, by stepping in and basically being an imposter for six weeks and winning that audience over and keeping that going was quite a remarkable feat. Absolutely remarkable. Any lesser actor couldn't have done that. What a marvellous piece of casting that was. Absolutely marvellous. And we have the series today that we have um, because of that that decision, that 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 actor coming in and that actor making such a success of it. Absolutely, oh, absolutely. Agree with I mean, you. you know, if you look at New Who, uh, sort of, you know, the, the the new kind of spin on Doctor Who, which for me really, it's <clears throat> it's it's standing on the shoulders of the classic series. Without the classic series, there would be no New Who. The history is all in in the previous, you know, the previous classic show, without a doubt. Um, what next for Phil Morris? What next? Well, first of all, I think we need to deal with this virus situation, which seems like I'm stuck in the middle of a Doctor Who episode as we speak. Um, so once that's cleared up, I'll be back on my travels. Not in this thing behind me, of course. I'll be taking the normal route on the, on the aeroplane. I think it's a lot safer and this thing's not that reliable anyway. it never get me where I want to go. Absolutely not. Well, I've got to say, Web of Fear is absolutely in my top three stories. And it's because of the work that you've undertaken, Phil, that I've been able to sit and watch what is for me one of the, well, it's, it's one of the best Target novels, but it's actually one of the best Doctor Who serials. Um, an amazing feat of television. Enemy of the World, quite underrated. Yet, yeah, when you brought home the episodes, what a classic that's become now. Yes, absolutely. Which, to be honest with you, really pleases me. I mean, <clears throat> if we talk about Web of Fear first, episode four, that is, you know, it's just Douglas Camfield, the direction that he gives there. It's just an action-packed piece, you know, and when you consider such a creative director and, and what he did there, fantastic, fantastic episode. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, you, you, but as, as, Jason, as for Enemy of the World, now, I do know this, that that was David Whittaker. He was really pleased with that story. He was never pleased with Power of the Daleks. <coughs> Excuse me. He was never pleased with Power of the Daleks, but he was really pleased with Evil of the Daleks. And his favourite story, twinned with Enemy of the World, was, of course, The Crusade. So they were his two favourite scripts that he ever submitted for the programme. And, you know, I was delighted to get it back, but also to get it reappraised. You know, to just have that one episode with just, you know, you know, a caravan and a couple of corridors was awful. But when you get, you know, the feel of it and the performance from Patrick playing those two dual roles, obviously the Doctor himself and then Salamander as well. You know, it's a tour de force. It, it, it's absolutely a wonderful piece. Wonderful. It's like a, it's almost like a mini movie. Um, you've got all the sort of bits with the with the underground caverns and the lift down to the underground caverns and, and Patrick playing Salamander. It's just stuff of proper, almost James Bond-esque, isn't it? It is Doctor Who's James Bond, without a shadow of a doubt. It's Doctor Who does, doc, you know, does basically uh, from Russia with love, really. I think it's something like that. You know, it's it, but it's a wonderful piece. Beautifully, beautifully written by a really, you know, David Whittock was there at the beginning. You know, he's a, you know, he's a foundation stone of Doctor Who. And it's, it's a pleasure for me to put that story back in the place of the fans. And I'm quite sure that David Whittaker's watching us from up above and, you know, he's got a little smile on his face that, you know, it's been reappraised and, you know, it's, it's bigger now than it ever was, really. Wonderful piece. Wonderful. I certainly hope he has. We get to watch 
Um, enemy of the world as part of the time space visualizer tweet along um, later today. Um, we're really, really looking forward to that. Phil, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Time's run out on us now. Um, always a pleasure to, to, to hear the insights and, and some of the behind the scenes in, in what you've done. Bring us home some more at some point in the future. We really would love it. Jason, anything is possible. Anything is possible, believe me. Anything is possible. I'd be delighted. Phil, thanks very much for your time today. Thanks, Jason. Thank you.